Well, hi. I'd like to first apologize a little bit for some dumb things I said last time. Uh, first, I, I said that Foucault said that Marx sucks. Well, Foucault didn't really say Marx sucks. He would never say anything like that. I just took that to be the, the clear implication of the, the closing pages of the order of things. And then I also referred to DNA. I was talking about how um, Foucault was talking about cultural codes and how things are run by codes, uh, building on Levi Strauss's uh, structuralism. And I mentioned DNA. But that was just an example of a biological code everyone knows about. Foucault didn't actually mention DNA himself. He couldn't have. It hadn't been, hadn't been discovered yet. And the other dumb thing I did was I think I might have pronounced wrong the French word for man, L apostrophe H-O-M-M-E. -M -M -E. I call it lum. It seems like lum to me, but people who perhaps know French better than I do say I should have said lom. But in any case, that's what it means. It means man. And, and, the, and, and Foucault's usage is sort of a stand-in for humanities. As well, today we're going to talk about um, his next book, 1969, uh, The Archaeology of Knowledge. This is a book that defines itself as an answer to a question that Foucault succinctly stated in a letter to the editor he wrote about the same time to the French magazine Esprit. He said, he posed the question of the relationship of the constraints of the system to the human subject. In the English-speaking world, sometimes we talk about the relationship of systems to persons or structures to individuals. So it's a question that blends into the question, how does historical change happen? Do people change history, or is history driven by forces independent of human will? Foucault's terms, as he expresses himself in the beginning of this 1969 book, it's a question about the sources of the innovations that produce discontinuities. The problem arises, he says in the introduction to the book, because another, so it's a problem. This, this is something Foucault is complaining about, and he's writing his book to answer these people. The, the, the historians have treated economic history as a history of physical events, as if the behavior of markets were determined by floods, births, and deaths and the same sort of physical causes uh, of other things. He also makes it clear in his introduction that uh, while the book can be regarded as a critique of some economic interpretations of history, it is also a critique of the somewhat different and also somewhat similar thinking of a certain philosopher he does not name. Now, I beg leave to remark that this whole sort of question does not actually, for me, I have to say, it's for me, it's sort of a non-question. You know, we can say, well, is history driven by blind forces that are out of human control, or do humans make history? We can pose that as a question, um, it's, but it doesn't, it's, it, in the, the way I view the world, and people like me view the world, it's not really, uh, uh, the, it's not it's not really a good way to pose the question, or not it's not a question at all. And why? Why not? Well, it's because if we uh, think about rules and norms, I mean, rules and norms, and we we learn from Wittgenstein, late Wittgenstein, Vinch, Hare, Secord, and Searle, people like that, um, like uh, Charles Taylor, people I've been talking about, um, then this misunderstanding the same misunderstanding that Foucault complains about that makes people worry about whether economic history can be treated as if it were a history of physical events is a misunderstanding inherent in the very idea of economics. Okay, so what we're saying, or what I want to recommend, and is an institutionalist view of economics, well, which is still economics, but it's maverick economics. That's the very idea of economics as a quasi-physical science uh, already doesn't make any sense to people like me. We want to say that institutions are made of rules and economics is about institutions. Uh, I might mention that an early draft of uh, The Wealth of Nations, The Wealth of Nations started out as the concluding series in Adam Smith's lectures on the history of jurisprudence. It was sort of like the, the lectures on contemporary jurisprudence. And that's what we think, as we think that uh, when we're talking about 
the laws of supply and demand and other things that economists talk about, we're working within the institutional framework of a certain juridical pattern, and it's that juridical pattern that really uh, uh, needs to be understood. Or in other words, as Emil Durkheim and others thought, we should really think of economics as a subsection of uh, sociology. And of sociology is having to do with the norms and rules of, of a given culture at a given point in history. Well, if you think that way, then the sort of question Foucault asked at the beginning of the archaeology of knowledge uh, that he wants to sort of deal with uh, comes up in a different light. It's sort of like two ships that pass in the night. The sort of um, okay. So I've been recommending thinking about rules in ways that I've just described. And I include in the very, we, I should say we, include in the very concept of a rule or a norm what H.L.A. Uh, Hard, professor of jurisprudence at Oxford, called its internal aspect. That is, people consciously and deliberately follow rules. They look to rules for guidance. So, so good old Aristotle was on the right track. Remember, Aristotle talked about conscious deliberation, proarisis, that precedes human action. Actions form habits. Aristotle. Habits generate ethics. Ex ethics organize human conduct. So for this reason, uh, when Foucault introduces his letter to the editor in his book by saying he's going to address questions about the constraints of the system, his questions seem to me to be sort of out of focus. Now, of course, I realize, well, of course, I understand in a way where he's coming from. He's coming, as he says, he's coming from uh, French structuralist anthropology and similar movements in the 1960s. Um, so, of course, when I say this, when I say that you know humans are conscious actors in history because humans are rule followers and history is about institutions and institutions are made of rules, when I say that, of course, I, I'm not denying the obvious. I realize that when Millicent Jones, let's call her Millicent Jones, she goes to the shopping mall, she wants to buy a Barbie doll for her daughter Deirdre, who's three, okay? So Millicent doesn't really know I know she doesn't know that the norms of a society of mass consumption have been shaped by uh, a certain sort of economic necessity to keep up consumption for the sake of keeping profits rolling in. So a regime of accumulation, as some people say. Uh, so, but Millicent does deliberately buy the Barbie doll. She knows other people's children have them and she wants, other, she wants her daughter to have a Barbie doll too. So under, to understand the rules that guide her behavior, we say, we need to consider their internal aspect. What goes on in her mind as she follows them? You can call this approach uh, phenomenological. Sure, surely Millicent does not know the history of the rise of consumerism. N nevertheless, she, she, doesn't understand, no, she doesn't understand the consequences for uh, militarism and lots of other things of millions of people uh, acting as she does. Nevertheless, to understand her, and most importantly, to change the world, we need to understand the Millicents on their own terms and to acknowledge their autonomy as human persons. So Foucault addresses these conundrums posed by people being at the same time individuals and, it, and also parts of giant systems uh, in a different way. I mentioned he has in mind Levi Strauss. He also has in mind Jacques Lacan and Dumaisil regarding unconscious hidden deep structures. So Foucault is talking about unconscious hidden deep structures. I'm talking about unintended consequences of deliberate acts. Um, so they, these people talk about what goes on in people's minds without them knowing anything about them or making any decisions regarding them. He writes about economic historians who find long period continuities that for some readers look like consequences of systemic constraints. He appears to have in mind the Annals historians, Marc Bloch, Lucien Fevre, Fernand Brodel. Now, I've been subscribing to a point of view in which the systemic imperatives of capitalism are real enough, but they're not systemic constraints analogous to the underlying structures found by Chomsky in his deep grammar or by Levi Strauss in, in uh, the logic of myths. I think that Levi Strauss uh, mixed genres of causality when he said he was inspired by Lyell's geology and by Marx's economics, as if the underlying invisible determining structures of tectonic plates deep beneath the earth 
were somehow uh, the same sort of causality as the logic of capital accumulation. So what happens in commercial transactions, when like Millicent buying a Barbie doll, is that people buy and sell. They know what they're doing. Usually they haven't read Marx or Cux Luxembourg or Keynes, but they don't know the long-term consequences of many people following the same logic of everyday life. But they are writing contracts. Sometimes they sign contracts. They get receipts when they buy something. They have property rights that are recorded on deeds that are held at courthouses. The, the system is made up of what Aristotle called praxis, that is physical activity accompanied by talk that people talk about and reflect on as they act. St. Thomas called it a human acts. Ramhare calls it self-monitoring activity. From such a point of view, the question what to do as an activist to move history, notice it, from this kind of point of view that I'm favoring, uh, to move history, to change history in, in desirable ways as a sort of straightforward generic answer, what you do is you work to improve the rules of the game that guide human life and constitute human institutions. Okay, so what's, what's Foucault's take on all of this? Back to Foucault. Now, the philosopher Foucault does not name is, of course, Jean-Paul Sartre. The archaeology of knowledge is partly an engagement with the Sartrean version of Marx. A version, Marx, this is Sartre's version, um, or at least this is Foucault's uh, interpretation of what Sartre says. Sartre says revolutions are subjective consciousness assuming the management of human affairs. That's what the the critique of dialectical reason of Sartre is about. It's about you know, how we pull off a revolution by getting the subjective consciousness united as a great historic actor which will assume the management of human affairs and end the prehistory of humanity and begin the, uh, the liberation of, of the species. Now, um, uh, we're also um, avoiding now I'm talking about uh, an um, ethical reading of Marx. What when uh, when uh, in his introduction, Foucault talks about an Althusserian reading of Marx, and Althusser is obviously well now obviously people know about these things. He's obviously opposing. Um, ethical readings of Marx. And he said the early writings of Marx were pre-Marxist. Marx didn't become a Marxist until later in his career because he was a, and then he says, and then he, he mentions uh, people like Pierre Bigot, Jean-Yves Calvé, who are uh, sort of Catholics writing about Marxism as an ethical system. That's uh, sort of a, uh, absurd. And he says, these, these guys don't know anything about Marx. Well, um, so, Foucault refers to an Althusserian Marx, an anti-humanist one who achieved an epistemological mutation. So he's, he's, he's giving uh, credit to uh, Althusser for having uh, achieved an epistemological mutation by not referring to ethics and by having a non-humanist uh, version of historical materialism. Okay. So the main philosophical target here, the Sartrean revolutionary consciousness, is that one and the same time, like the tendency of the economic historians of Brodel and the Annal School, it's, it's a big theory that threatens to become a total theory purporting to explain everything. And here, what we want to do, what Foucault wants to do, is break up uh, big theories. A few years later, we'll find out he talks about being against general intellectuals who have big theories and for specific intellectuals who study smaller matters. Um, so, um, at the same time that Sartre's philosophy tends to be one of these monster totalizing theories that are anathema to the Foucault of 1969, it also is a philosophy which conceives of humans as free, and here I'm uh, here I'm saying that the early Sartre and the 
late sort were not much different in this respect. Uh, so without ever mentioning him by name, uh, Foucault complains about Sartre in language like this. Now I'm going to quote Foucault. Time is conceived in terms of totalization. Bad. So, so totalization is out. And revolutions are never understood as anything other than achievements of consciousness. Another bad thinking of human subjective consciousness as, a, as, a, as existing to start with and also as a, as a motive force that changes history. So what is Foucault's methodological alternative here? What does he propose? And what, this is actually sort of a book about how to do archaeology. And he did archaeology in 1966, and now he's writing a book, kind of a guide for a handbook for how to do archaeology, how to do the kind of research into the history of thought that uh, Foucault does. And his, what he opts for as a sort of key starting point is dispersion, dispersion. He proposes dispersion as a sort of uh, litmus test for the right way to do research. It separates the sheep from the goats, the sense from the nonsense. Uh, le legitimate uh, research like what he himself does uh, from bogus totalizing. It cuts the ground out just by the, the methodological stance, by sort of taking dispersion as where you begin and what you stick with. It cuts the ground out from big pretentious theories like Sartre's theory of dialectical reason, when theories of the economic historians like uh, Wallerstein, for example, Modern World System, and Frodel's uh, long-range picture of how historical discontinuities come about. So the method begins at a descriptive level, defining the items to be described. He calls them enonces, or interchangeably, he calls them discursive elements. Or uh, This is mysterious, but this word enonce, I'm not going to I'm not going to try to, I'm just going to use enonce, but you can call it in English a locution, a discursive event, or something like that, uh, something something somebody said or somebody wrote. And, uh, so uh, Colin Gordon, uh, Colin Gordon, a commentator on Foucault, glosses this term enonce as meaning effective oral or written utterances. Well, this is what you start with. Remember what, what Foucault does is he works in libraries. He goes down to the basements and finds the libraries of what they were writing in the 17th century, what they were writing in the 16th, these old French libraries. And what he finds in there are a lot of enonces. There's something somebody said, somebody wrote at some, some point in time. So, but what, what makes these dispersed enonces clearly different from uh, language games, as Wittgenstein would talk about, or Praxis, as Aristotle would talk about, what makes them clearly different is that they're to be understood as uh, separate. They're not patterns. Remember, a language game is always a pattern. It's always it's a, the action is in a game. Or um, many people will say meaning is always in a field. Uh, the meaning of something is always in a field of meanings. No, we're talking about something that's separate, uh, uh, dispersed. I take it dispersed means something like separated or, or individual. So then he talks about domains of enonces. And they are, I'm quoting Foucault, constituted by the set of all enonces in their dispersion of events. It is a population of events in the space of discourse in general. So somehow he's built up something a little bigger or seeming to be still talking about enonces. I'm, I, I, don't, I, don't, I can't make this clear. My, my opinion is it's just impossible to make it clear but uh, because it's not clear. But I'm, I'm uh, that's what he says. I just quoted uh, what he says. Uh, quoting Foucault, domains of enonces are constituted by the set of all enonces, whether spoken or written, in their dispersion of events. It is a population of events in the space of discourse in general. So Foucault's, Foucault's enonces are also different from some other notions taken to be the ground level starting point of a scientific method because they're not documents, they're monuments. And that's another point he makes. See, his, his idea is that, well, if you're looking for documents, these documents supposedly represent something. They document something. But by calling them monuments, he wants to say they just are. That is, this is supposed to be really uh, non-committal, open-minded, uh, totally uh, uh, non-committal, just looking at these sort of speech events called enonces as they are, letting them speak for themselves, 
and letting them be for themselves. Oh, I said that wrong. I shouldn't even say they speak for themselves. They just be. They're there. Okay. So, for several chapters, Foucault elaborates on how to do archaeological research, starting with enoncés, building up a theoretical machinery whose parts are defined in terms of enoncés, in which each part is as subtle and as elusive as the enoncés themselves. The parts of the some these are a few of the a few of the technical terms that uh, Foucault invents are discursive formations, objects, concepts, archives. He ends up with archives. What's an archive? An archive, quote Foucault, is a full set of discourses effectively pronounced. An archive is not just any set of items, but it's a set which has its own principles of transformation. So you know we're sort of hearing echoes of Levi Strauss and uh, and uh, and uh, transformational linguistics. So Foucault invents also a number of other technical terms, which I'm not going to mention because I don't think they make any sense. Uh, I don't think giving the bare names out of context means anything. But let's focus on three things. How does this proliferation of technical terms start? What is constant through all this proliferation of technical terms? And where does it end up? Now he starts with what he calls a rough idea of enonces, and then he says it'll gradually become clear as we go along exactly what an enonce is. That's how he starts. But what remains constant is dispersion. This enonces are dispersed. They are separated individual things. So all along, true to his anti-totalizing, anti-Sartrean approach, he sticks with dispersion. So when he discusses the historical, remember the historical a priori. Remember, remember uh, for going back to madness and civilization, uh, you can't talk about insanity until it becomes possible to talk about insanity. And that's, there has to be an historical uh, development of a possibility of meaning before you can talk about things. Okay, So uh, back then, it looked as though uh, this historical a priori was uh, part of a whole systems of meanings which made it possible to talk about folie or uh, nuttiness or, you know, or finally insanity. But now he says um, to, I'm quoting Foucault, uh, even the historical a priori must give an account of the enoncés in their dispersion. So we're going to stick with this idea of dispersion even when we're speaking on what would appear to be a rather generalizing level. Now the archive. I'm going to quote Foucault on what an archive is. The archive is, first of all, the law of what can be said. So it sounds as though the archive is taking the place of the, uh, of the episteme of 1966 and the historical a priori of 1961. So. The archive, I'm quoting again, is first of all the law of what can be said, the system which governs the appearance of singular events. It is that which, at the very root of the enoncé événement, you know, we're talking about we have, have the locution event, and in the body where it is given, this the archive defines the entry into the game of the system in which it can be said. Well, having said that, he then very carefully explains that the archive is not a structure or a generality of any kind. It is somehow faithful to the basic idea of dispersion, separation, but nonetheless, somehow it provides a sort of law which defines what can be said. Okay, well, if, if you find it incredible that Foucault can remain true to his principle of dispersion and also find it an archive, something that defines what it's possible to say, then you're in good company. Uh, Richard Rorty, for one, thought that of all, uh, that archaeology of knowledge was the least convincing of all of Foucault's books. Okay, so much for methodology of research. Now, let's go back to this question of humanism, of uh, loam, as I maybe should have said, or loam, as it seems to me, right? Um, the man, the humanity. The arguments against uh, 
against um, humanism, we'll call it, against LUM, take a different turn with the publication of the Archaeology of Knowledge in 1969. Um, I might mention that in his own mind this different turn apparently happened a little earlier because Foucault wrote at one point that he actually had finished the book before the great uh, student revolt uh, of 1968. So apparently it wasn't published till 1969, but the ideas in it, he came to before this uh, almost revolution that sort of shook the foundations of French society in May and June of 1968. But now with this, this new term, what's the new term? The new term in, in, in the archaeology of knowledge is this. He makes the arguments uh, against humanism and he relies more on Alain Robrier. Well, who's he? He's a novelist who wrote novels in which events lack patterns and characters lack coherent personalities. So, uh, so the possibility of writing these novels where the, the novels without characters because the characters are incoherent, they don't really have personalities. And, and they, he doesn't rely so much as he used to on uh, people like Levi Strauss who analyzed the sort of underlying logical, mythical structure of, uh, of different myth systems. Talking about Sigmund Freud, uh, when he talks about Sigmund Freud and his findings in, in the archaeology of knowledge, what he says is Freud finds a pulsing of desire. So this pulsing of desire is something sort of uh, crude and disorganized and sort of fundamental, that's not the same thing as sort of like the system of unconscious ideas, uh, which would be a different way of reading Freud, which would be more characteristic of, of Foucault in 66. So he doesn't, he doesn't rely on the idea before, he was talking about Jacques Lacan, why is there no such thing as a human being? Well, it's because when Jacques Lacan, Jacques Lacan does the psychoanalysis, what he finds is language. And language, of course, is a, is a system. It's something that uh, has nothing to do with any particular speaker. So he's relying more on dispersion and less on system to sort of make his anti-humanist case. So three years later, Foucault is still an anti-humanist. He was an anti-humanist in 66. He's an anti-humanist in 69. But his reasons are roughly the opposite of what they were earlier. In the order of things, Lum or Loam, does not exist. Why? Well, because he's been swallowed up by great self-governing cultural codes where there's no room and no need for a conscious subject. But in the archaeology of knowledge, again, humans don't exist, but why not? It's because everything is fragmentation, dispersion, uh, separation. It's, it's so this increasing emphasis on the dispersed and singular, and let me let's make a little, one little hypothesis of what might have had something to do with this. Uh, Jacques Derrida, uh, in a review article, uh, had accused Foucault of being a totalitarian structuralist. This is an article Derrida wrote in 63. Maybe that, went, maybe that got to him. Maybe he, he sort of, Derrida's criticism kind of uh, shook him and he wanted to prove he wasn't a totalitarian structuralist, but by uh, emphasizing uh, fragmentation and dispersion as he did in his, uh, in, in his 1969 book. I don't know what the direct influence might have been of that uh, little attack on that as a response. But anyway, the same guy who earlier said he didn't believe in Sartrean meaning because Levi Strauss and Lacan had convinced him that meaning was a mere surface effect of deep underlying structures. The same person who earlier said that the archaeological level is a deep underlying level now says, now I'm going to quote Foucault, what I am researching are not secret relationships hidden, more silent or deeper than the consciousness of men. I seek on the contrary to define the relationships that are on the very surface of discourse. I'm, I'm quoting Foucault. I seek to make visible what is only invisible because it is too much on the surface of things. That's Foucault, 1969. So according to his, um, so now having said that, 
uh, you know, how is this consistent with his own past? Well, it's not. And he admits it. He, he, he says himself in 1969, uh, for example, he says as he reconstructs and corrects his own past, he goes back to madness and civilization. And he said, well, back then, I was still writing as if history had some sort of subject, right? Not to be sure uh, a Cartesian or Husserlian, a Humean individual consciousness, but some sort of anonymous and general subject of history. You can see that on many pages in the madness, and excuse me, in uh, madness and civilization. Many pages you can find something like for the 17th century. The 17th century becomes like a conscious entity that has a certain view of things. They're sort of collective uh, historical subject now because says, well, he repents in 1969. <coughs> it didn't make any sense when I was writing Madness and Civilization to sort of speak of a collective subject changing its mind about how to think of uh, the marginal people and gradually developing the notion of insanity. Um, so I'm, I'm going to quote Foucault. Um, I had imagined there was, quote, an anonymous and general subject of history which had experiences of folie, that is to say of madness, that differed from one period of time to another. Uh, then he apologizes for the birth of the clinic. He says, in the birth of the clinic, I was too close to structural analysis. I was in danger of ignoring the specificity of the problem posed. And in the order of things, He'd written of cultural totalities, the famous epistemes. So having used these totalizing explanations of the structuralist to argue that the human subject was an outdated illusion that should now be abandoned, he now distances himself from them. So at one point in 69, he says, among all the diverse trends in social sciences, the central transformation taking place in our times is one that questions the subject. Okay. So he's still questioning the subject, but he's questioning it now a different way. He questions the privilege of the human. He says, my own thought, he says, my own thought is part of this great transformation taking place in the social sciences in our times, which is the questioning of the subject. And he says, I'm located along, now he says, I'm located alongside structuralism. Uh, I wasn't, I'm not a totalitarian structuralist, as Derrida accused me of being. I, I'm beside structuralism. I come to a similar conclusion, namely uh, the absence of human subjects, but I come to it in a different way. Elsewhere in an interview for an Italian magazine at the same year, he says that for a long time he had what he called a badly resolved conflict between his um, um, literary interests his, writing, his reading of literature and his reading of the social sciences. He's telling this reporter from the Italian magazine that for a long time, you know, I was really uh, very much influenced by Georges Bataille and, uh, and his eroticism, an erotic, imaginary writer of, of, well, sort, of, of sort of fiction. And the language of Blanchot, uh, he discusses certain mu musicians were very important to him, Boulet and Baraquet the painter Clay. This was his sort of artistic life. Uh, we, of course, we, he wrote a whole book about this, the Raymond Roussel, which we discussed earlier. On the other hand, he was interested in these artistic expressions of uh, sort of avant-garde uh, writing. But on the other hand, he was reading the sciences. For example, Georges Dumézil's studies of uh, myths, Hindu myths of India, and Claude Lévi-Strauss. So the first now, get this. It was the first, it was the artistic side of Foucault that led to dispersion. So he says, no, this, uh, this business of dispersion didn't just come out of nowhere in 1969. For a long time, in my engagement with literature, I've been engaged with dispersion. And I had this badly resolved conflict uh, in my own mind. So this these literary sources, uh, led to the dispersion, the dissolution, the disappearance of the er erotic subject and the speaking subject. They suggested to him a theme which he then transposed later 
to social science and analogous disappearance of the subject. Um, as in the hot intensity of orgasm, one can cease to exist as a social person, so in the cold light of science, one can cease to exist as a social person. This, okay, now, what is a humanist ideal? We're still in this, and uh, in his sort of uh, interviews in 1969, yes. Well, what is the humanist idea? We're going to talk about this with the reporter, and the answer is, quote Foucault, neither more nor less than that of the idea of God. Well, of, course, of course, we all know, at least Foucault knows, that since Nietzsche, God doesn't exist, therefore the humanist ideal doesn't exist either. Well, that's one. Oh, I, I, I use the word therefore as if Foucault had one argument for this conclusion, and I think I'm showing this. He had several ways of getting to the same conclusion. Um, so I'm going to quote Foucault again. The role of the philosopher, which is that of saying what is happening. Now, notice this. He's picking up, this he picked up from Nietzsche. What's the role of the philosopher here? The philosopher is telling people what's going on in their culture. He sort of reads the culture and interprets it for people so they know, you know, what's happening in our uh, in culture today. Okay, back to quoting Foucault. The role of the philosopher, which is that of saying what's happening, consists perhaps today of showing that humanity is beginning to discover that it can function without myths. Okay, so what's happening now in 1969 in Europe or in the world is that humanity is beginning to discover that it can function without myths. The, continuing to quote, quote Foucault, the disappearance of philosophies and religions so, relates no doubt to something of that sort. So what's happening in the mid-20th century is that philosophies are disappearing, religions are disappearing, and this is something like humanity uh, coming of age, learning to live without myths. Okay, I want to do now a little flashback to 1963, which I think will shed some light on the Foucault of 69. In 1963 sort of uh, uh, praise of one of the sources mentioned before, Georges Bataille, Foucault devotes many pages to long paradoxical poetic sentences whose meaning is that at this point in history there's no meaning. And about the 20th page he takes a break from fanciful images as if he needed to catch his breath and there he explains that the worldview he's praising, that is, that of the er erotic author Georges Bataille, is an, al is an alternative to um, its getting beyond an economic interpretation of history. Got it? So he's, uh, he's saying, look, I've been reading all this literature and I think this guy Bataille is really great, and what's really great about him is that he's uh, making clear that there's no meaning, and this is an alternative to an economic interpretation of history. So it's an alternative to uh, uh, to these people he said he was going to be criticizing in his introduction to the archaeology of knowledge. So what, what's the, well, one thing? What's I don't know how he goes on to say? I'm going to quote Foucault. What's wrong with an economic interpretation of history? It's based entirely on need, and need based itself on the model of hunger. So this is something you want to reject. You want to reject the idea that history is run by human needs or by uh, hunger, people trying to get food. We want to go with uh, a literary figure like uh, Bataille. So I regard this as a scrap of evidence supporting my thesis, which is similar to the thesis of Jürgen Habermas, that Foucault can be read as a young conservative who opposed common sense because he realized, consciously, semi-consciously, unconsciously, he opposed common sense because he realized that common sense, ordinary meaning, and an economic interpretation of history go together. They jointly lead to the herd morality, as Nietzsche said, to democracy, to socialism, to the anarchism that Friedrich Nietzsche, another, another of Foucault's sources, hated and feared. So, the archaeology of knowledge uh, sets out to be an explanation of the archaeological method, offered as an alternative 
to the sort of economically oriented history practiced by the Annals School and as an alternative to Sartre's vision of conscious revolutionary transformation. It regarded as error much of what Foucault himself had done in the past. But one can also read this book as marking a turning toward a version of positivism. There's a certain similarity between starting with a single isolated enoncé in, uh, in documents regarded as monuments and like Bertrand Russell talking about atomic facts. You start with small facts and you build them up to uh, with like truth functional sentences, if P then Q, P then Q, P or Q. This sort of classic uh, generation of uh, mathematics and science out of basic individual components, that's, that's l l logical positivism of the early 20th century. And also the word uh, positivity keeps cropping up as, as, as something that people are supposed to study. Um, well, this sort of positive turn, or turn toward dispersion, proved not to last very long. About a year later, uh, a, a turn that lasted longer came, the, what we'll call the Nietzschean turn, where Foucault declares himself a disciple of Friedrich Nietzsche and takes some key concepts from Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, based mainly uh, or largely on the seminal work by Nietzsche, the, the genealogy of morals. So after the Nietzschean turn, Foucault most of the time would stop calling his work archaeology and start calling it a genealogy, and not always. Um, sometimes he could use, would use both terms. So now let me close with a short review of what we talked about so far. Uh, Foucault's first book, the book he preferred to forget, was an exposition of the materialist psychology uh, that he later devoted himself to fighting. His 1955 introduction to Binswanger's defended Menschsein, or being human, or being, um, with arguments borrowed from Heidegger. His 1957 articles on psychology recommended the study of history as the only possible route to understanding human beings. So then he practiced what he preached in his doctoral dissertation, his 1961 polemic against positivism, the uh, madness in civilization. He used enormous quantities of historical detail to show that the social world taken for granted by psychology and psychiatry is neither natural, nor eternal, nor desirable. And then the birth of the clinic, a little bit later, he did the same thing for medicine that he'd done for uh, psychiatry. But this immersion in the details of history, according to uh, my reading of it, led Foucault in the direction he didn't want to go. So his next book, Raymond Roussel, praised literary imagination more than historical fact. He now appeared as an historian inspired mainly not by his Marxist teacher, Louis Althusser, not by his phenomenology teacher, Amores Merleau-Ponty, and not by the professor of the history of science who had sponsored his doctoral dissertation, Georges Canguilhem. Now Foucault was inspired by his independent reading of works of fiction. At least that's Machery's interpretation, which I think is plausible and explains why he wrote the book, Raymond Roussel. So now language structures experience. Foucault learned this from literature and applied it to history. Then the order of things, Les Moëls et les Choses of 1966, the thesis is that cultural codes determine not, not precisely history, but the organization of knowledge at any given point in history. The cultural codes determine so much that the human subject fades away. So this is a, a, in a way it's a sort of a strange result because Foucault says he learned that social science can proceed without subjects and from his literary readings that novels can be written without characters. But it's strange that philosopher who dedicated himself so passionately to defending Menschsein when he was when he was a youth in his very first writings, uh, is now takes it to be good news that human subjects can be made to fade away. One can hardly resist the hypothesis that there is some underlying constant in Foucault's motivation such that at one time it's humanism, and another time anti-humanism serving for him the same constant purpose. Well, what could this constant purpose be? Well, 
we, to start with, it's not hard to find a constant purpose served by varying philosophical arguments when you compare the order of things of 66 to the archaeology of knowledge of 69. The constant purpose is to refute Jean-Paul Sartre. I, it's hard for us to imagine. I'm, I'm older than most, most people. In the, I'm old enough to remember that there was a time when Jean-Paul Sartre had an enormous prestige and uh, he had a, a huge following uh, and people thought, you know, if you're going to be really sincere and uh, an authentic human being, you have to take responsibility for your freedom and you have to be engagé with the oppressed. And uh, Sartre was sort of a, a symbol for, for many people with a huge uh, following at, at a time uh, now forgotten. But uh, Foucault grew up with that too, so he didn't forget it. So it makes sense that he would uh, take Sartre seriously as somebody who needs to be corrected if he's wrong because Sartre had lot, many followers. Foucault deleted explicit references to Sartre from the first book, the 66 book, but he clearly makes Sartre a target in his introduction to the second book. The second book announces itself from the beginning as an alternative methodology of social science designed to correct the errors of people like Sartre, that is to say the errors of people who think both that subjective consciousness determines human action and that economic forces determine the course of history. I would say either, either or both. Uh, Sartre being um, um, famous for being somehow reconciling the two. But if you either believe that economic forces shape the course of history or that subconscious determine, subcon that the subjective Consciousness determines human action. Uh, either way, the 1969 book is the polemic against uh, what you think. So the methodology um, offered in 1969 corrects archaeology as it explains it, as he, he corrects his archaeology of the past, and he now resembles an Occam's razor positivist historian who parsimoniously shaves the documents he finds in libraries to not take them as representing or standing for anything more than simply being there. The primary unit of discourse is found in the statement, the enonce, which does not represent anything. It has no necessary connection with anything else. Knowledge begins in dispersion. I quote Foucault, the analysis of statements that enonces then is a historical analysis, but one that avoids all interpretation. Okay, well, how, 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 how much more positivist than you, can you get than to insist that you're going to do uh, social science avoiding all interpretation? So if finally a study of the entire archive shows that there are patterns in the dispersion that mark historical discontinuities or exclude certain possibilities, they are not patterns determined by an originating consciousness. See, none, none, none of this Kantian stuff, an originating consciousness is going to find a pattern or by laws of historical development. The 17th and the 17th and 18th century classical age of the 66th book no longer has an episteme, the cultural code which he took so much trouble to construct, he now uh, renounces. To refer to the classical age now is simply to give a name to observed continuities and discontinuities. So, in conclusion, Jean-Paul Sartre is wrong again, but now he's wrong for different reasons. That's all. <laughs>